Welcome to Read Your Comics. Today, I'm looking at the Jack Kirby Collector, number 31. The big one. If you've never seen a Jack Kirby Collector magazine before, this is definitely the one to get. Um, before this came out, the Jack Kirby Collector was mostly printed in just like magazine size. It, it was like about this size, right? And it, that's how it came out before. This is actually a later one, but... It went back to this this size. But for a while, they did this tabloid size. And just to give you more perspective on how big these things are, here's like a, a standard comic book size. Here's the Treasury Edition size. And you can see it's, it's about the same width, maybe just a smidgen smaller right there, but a, a hair bigger too. So pretty close to the Treasury. And even the more modern Marvel Treasuries they've been putting out like this grand design you can kind of see the the scale right there how it's like even bigger there just to give you an idea of just how big and massive these tabloid size jack kirby collectors were this was the first one they went to this size um that's why they call it the big one in the front and it's got a really cool wraparound cover most of the time it would have a front cover and the back cover would be something different but they went all out did a wraparound superman cover using um some collages from Jimmy Olsen issues that he did. Super cool. This is a really good issue. I've read this one almost cover to cover. Thought I'd just do like a little review of it or flip through and, and show it off. Um, and I'm not going to lie. I actually picked this one up for $3 from tomorrow's press sale about a year ago. I think it's sold out, but you can still find these on eBay. It did have a $10 cover price. So you know, you could probably, if you paid like $15 for this, you're still getting a good deal, honestly, because it is so jam-packed. I was just fortunate enough that they had some in stock when they did a big sale. So, you know, lucked out into it, but I would, I would pay more for it. I wouldn't buy it just on sale because it's totally worth it. Like any Jack Kirby collector, you're going to get some awesome penciled art pages. And sometimes they're just photo stats, but still you get to look at like really just an iconic page here. And I actually have this in another one where it's like double spread across the whole thing. Yeah, it was in uh, presented in Jack Kirby Collector number 22, but what better image to start off of our first big issue? Generally, and here's where you'll get cover update to. This issue's cover was inspired by Jimmy Olsen 138, The Big Boom. It was inked by Neil Adams. So this cover was inked by Neil Adams, but that was done off a of Kirby sketch posthumously. So it's not from that actual book. So start off with an interesting article about, you know, the big idea. So they're going to start out their big tabloid publication talking about Tur Kirby's top 10 big ideas. Uh, without going too far into them, I'll just say number 10 was Captain America. Number nine, Kid Gangs. Number eight, Romance Comics. Number seven, Mythology and Comics. That goes from Thor, The New Gods, Eternals, Double Page Spreads. I don't know that Kirby was the first to do a double page spread, but when you run across a Kirby double page spread, you have to pause and just soak it all in. The mid 60s Fantastic Four run, um, they said particularly number 45 through 60. And I would highly agree with that. I think that if you read the whole Fantastic Four run, it takes about 20 ish issues to really cement who the characters are. And by issue 45, we're introducing things like the Inhumans, Galactus, the Silver Surfer, Black Panther, the Kree. Uh, it, it's just an explosion of ideas during that 45 through 60 run. Um, and they have number four being Galactus and Silver Surfer alone, which would actually fit into that. Uh, the Fourth World at number two. And number one they have is the Olsen effect. It says, I have this separate from the Fourth World proper in each issue was just chock full of stuff. And that's true. I've read some of those and every issue is just like big idea after big idea. For sheer inventiveness and creativity, Jimmy Olsen stands above all the rest in my mind as the single series that, in the shortest time, managed to include m the most amazing array of characters, concepts, and concoctions ever in a series. So that's kind of how they're going to kick off this issue. And, you know, it's just, they call it their opening shot. This was an interesting article by Bill Field, and he's recounting going to 
well, he's recounting meeting Jack Kirby and Neil Adams, but it's a funny story. He goes, him and a friend are going to meet Neil Adams at a convention. They bake a, they don't bake a cake. They have a cake made <laughs> and it says world's greatest cartoonist on the cake. And they go to the hotel with the plan to present it to Neil Adams and hoping to get some books signed and maybe even a sketch in the sketch pad they had. So they go to the front desk and they say they're there to deliver a cake that was ordered for him. <laughs> so they're being a little crafty. And it just so happens that he had just gone to the hotel restaurant and the uh, person at the front desk had, had heard the name like, oh, he's actually over in the restaurant if you just want to take it over there. So then they go to the restaurant and they kind of use the same line to get into the restaurant. And they find the table that Neil Adams is sitting at. And who else is sitting with him? None other, the, other than Jack Kirby. And Kirby is actually the one that spots him. And they were like teenagers at the time. And is like, hey, can I help you boys? And they were like, yeah, we uh, wanted to deliver this cake. You know, Kirby is actually the one they said that spoke up and addressed them and was like, I'd really love some cake. But how about this? Why don't you let us eat, eat our meal? Uh, give us about 45 minutes to eat and uh, we'll have some cake together. And they were like over the moon. So they go back out to the lobby to wait for them to have their dinner in peace. And the whole time they're also discussing, like, do you think he really meant it? Do you think they're really going to come out and have cake with us and blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, as they come out, Kirby sees them again. And he's like, I'm really, I'm really wanting some cake now. So he's, he said, why don't we're going to go back to our room to freshen up. You guys go get a table and we'll be back in just a minute. And, and they did. And Neil Adams joined back as well, along with uh, Kirby's wife, Roz, and Neil Adams' wife. So they basically get to have this like evening with Neil Adams and uh, Jack Kirby. And he relates all these interesting stories about, you know, working in comics and people he's worked with. Uh, he talked about the Sky Masters and working with Wally Wood and the... Uh, other the unrelated wood brothers who were the writers of sky masters and so on and these guys were just over the moon and they'll admit that at the time they weren't even the biggest kirby fans they were more into neil adams and they said neil adams was like just sitting there soaking it all up like a fan as well just taking everything kirby had to say in and not overtaking the conversation as neil adams kind of has a reputation of doing <laughs> and uh it was just really interesting. So before they submitted this article, even um, they had this Superman sketch by Kirby uh, to Sam it says best wishes, Jack Kirby. So this is a sketch that they used for the cover. And then they asked Neil Adams to uh, go over it and ink it like, you know, on a separate piece of paper, but just, I guess, light box it and do it again so that they could use it for the cover. And before they did it, they ran this article by, by uh neil adams and he approved it oh and one of the cool things that while they were having dinner or i'm sorry while they were having cake uh neil adams is approached that there's a call for him at the front desk so he excuses himself for a minute and when he comes back he brings the news that uh jerry siegel and joe schuster had uh, settled for the rights to superman to get a stipend a yearly stipend of royalties from Superman from DC around the time of the movie coming out. So can you imagine just sitting there? Like, first of all, you're sitting there having cake, <laughs> like after dinner cake with a couple of legends and that amazing news breaks. And Neil Adams was real involved in that, like getting Siegel and Schuster paid for Superman. So for him to get that m news in that moment had to be one of just the highlights of it. And they go on to say that that kind of like the conversation reinvigorated Kirby's conversation. And then they kept talking for hours on after that. So pretty interesting storyline there. You got Mark Avanier doing a Jack, Jack FAQ in this. He really breaks down who the inker for fantastic four might've been. I guess I hadn't really thought about it, but that's apparently a mystery as to who inked fantastic four, number one and two. And he breaks it down and narrows it down to a couple of names without any concrete decision on which one it certainly could have been. And in fact, it probably was more than one guy, as a lot of inkers tended to have, well, artists in general, tended to have assistance of some sort when they needed a deadline met or just even a buddy be like, hey, can you throw on some backgrounds on this for me? But he narrowed it down to Christian Rule, 
or George Klein. Um, two names I'm not particularly familiar with, but that's kind of what Mark Vanier, his speculation really was. But I think one of the more interesting things in this is he talked about how Kirby rarely ever looked at the inked work, often didn't even mind how it was inked. And if you know the stories of Vince Coletta eliminating uh, backgrounds and stuff to make it go quicker for him, he didn't even really hold that against Vince Coletta. He said as long as the story itself, the structure of the story, or things that impacted the story were all there, he didn't really mind if an inker did what they had to do to meet a deadline. However, during the New Gods run, Coletta was erasing figures and stuff in the background that would play a part in the storyline and that bothered Kirby and that's when he actually got Vince Coletta removed and apparently it was like very painful for Kirby to do that he didn't like somebody losing work and Evanier says that even after uh, Coletta had been removed from his books when Jack would talk to the editor at DC he would often ask, like, how is Vinny doing? Is he getting work? Is he OK? Um, that's a theme that's not only in this article, it's even in a later article where it discusses how Jack was always concerned about other people getting work and making sure they were able to provide for their family. And I, I found that a very humanizing story for Kirby to be so concerned about everyone else. You know, he had his own family to worry about and he's working ridiculous hours to keep food on his table and a roof over his family's head. And here he was also concerned about other people as well. So that was an interesting article by Vanier, mostly dealing with inkers and Kirby's relationship to inkers while also speculating on who the possible inker of fantastic four, number one and two were um, a lot of these images they put into these articles don't always necessarily um, relate to the article. Sometimes they do, but sometimes it's like they just want to stick a cool picture in. For instance, this is about Universal Studios opening up their Marvel attraction. Um, it had just opened and they went to it and they were looking for, you know, things that uh, were Kirby inspired. And they were like, well, we didn't really see anything that was directly Kirby inspired. There is a street sign that says Yancey Street uh, and a Stanley Boulevard, but most of it is all newer art and they understood that they were like this this is a theme park to promote ip not to promote a particular creator but still these are all things that kirby worked on the hulk fantastic four uh x-men and so on and that's that's pretty much the one page then you get this page from a black panther issue this is clearly a photo stat but it's so cool to see it in this big format and again i want to point out just how big this is compared to a standard size comic. Nice Kurt Busiek article here. He discusses uh, working for Topps Comics, doing the uh, Captain Victory reboot that was supposed to be a six issue series and got canceled after one. I think one of the interesting things he mentioned about it is Topps Comics insistence to bag books with a card. Um, they were a card company, so they wanted to promote their cards, obviously. But that kind of killed the books after the first round of them went out and some people were less than satisfied with them. And so they weren't going to pick up an another new book without being able to flip through it. And that just kind of killed Tops in general, overall. I thought that was an interesting comment by Busiek. He also discusses just general inspiration of Kirby uh, on his work including stuff for Astro City. And they ask him about the First Family, if you're familiar with Astro City, there's a, a, a group called the First Family. And he said that they're not exactly modeled after the Fantastic Four. They're, they're not a Fantastic Four archetype. They're a family archetype. And he said, like, while, you know, Alex Ross helps work on it, helps work on it, and he's going to Kirby it up a little bit more, that they weren't really intended to be even though they were first family FF, uh, they weren't really intended to be a FF direct copy of that for Astro City. And they, and they really aren't. They are, they are a family of superhero adventure explorers. But what, I mean, we only have a handful of stories with them. But what you get is not really, it, it's FF inspired. You can see the, the, 
connective tissue to the roots of, of, of FF, but it's, it's wholly different. Um, another thing he talks about is when he first discovers Kirby in the Fantastic Four reprints, the world's greatest comics, or it was called Marvel's World, no, I'm sorry, Marvel's Greatest Comics uh, reprint series. And he talks about getting those as a kid and while also getting the regular FF series. And he said he thought it was, he didn't realize there were reprints. And he laughed at himself thinking, how does Marvel know that these are the greatest ones to put in the greatest comics title? <laughs> and just the, the sub great <laughs> ones in the, in the main FF book. <laughs> it was pretty funny to, to think about it like that. Cause I, I'm relating it to like how I used to view like Marvel tales as a kid and, for a while, it took it took me a minute to figure out that those were like old comics just repackaged <laughs> when I first was like really young getting into comics. Um, since they did talk about Captain Victory, you do get some Captain Victory stuff here. There's the first family from uh, Astro City. Uh, he does talk about how um, one of his characters is kind of inspired by the Guardian, but also kind of Captain America. Great page there. And he was also getting ready to work with Steve Rude on a Thor miniseries at the time. So really solid. Here's a this is a Walt Simonson page, I think it says. Walt Simonson pencils from Secret City Saga number zero. That's pretty cool. Unused Rick and Rich Buckler image of the ninth man. And this page is Machine Man Pencils from 2001, number 10. Look at this, just the arm breaking off and hitting people. Um, article on Giant Man and how they kind of struggled to make Ant-Man work and then Giant Man work. And the opinion of this piece is that neither, Gi neither Ant-Man nor Giant Man really ever worked as a solo character and always better as an Avenger and how they kept trying to retool the character to, to work. This one's a good topic for discussion. Why did the fourth world fail? And I found the interesting thing in this was how, I guess we were in a, a comic slump at the time um, comics had their second boom in the 60s, but in the 70s, it was going through a cyclic, cyclical downturn. And DC was definitely on the losing end. Marvel had just taken over by that point. And also, Marvel was now able to flood the market because they had a different distribution network than when they had to rely on uh, DC as a publisher to uh, distribute their books. And once they had that go-ahead, they started pumping out just a glut of titles, including reprints. There is the conspiracy that Marvel was pumping out Kirby reprints in order to facilitate the downfall of DC's Kirby books. You know, it's hard to say. Really, I think they were just trying to take up shelf space and market share, and it wasn't necessarily a coordinated attack on Kirby. But there is an interesting chart in here this chart breaks down each month and how many Marvel books were coming out with Kirby reprints, if not a Kirby straight up Kirby cover versus how many DC books were coming out. And it's pretty startling actually. I mean, like look at, we have March 71 from DC. You had two Kirby books and all of these Kirby books coming out from Marvel, including Fantastic Four 108, which was Kirby's unfinished final issue that kind of got repasted together. And I think John Buscema and maybe even John Romita helped fill that out. So you have Fanta they're counting Fantastic Four 108. Creatures on the Loose, number 10, with a Kirby cover. Fear with a Kirby cover. Marvel's Greatest Comics, number 30. Uh, some of those have had different covers, but uh, I'd have to go back and look and see if number 30 was a Kirby cover. Um, My Love, number 10, Nick Fury, um, 18 with the cover. Sergeant Fury, 85 with cover. Uh, Where Creatures Roam with cover. Where Monsters Dwell, number 5. So 
and this one in January 71 too. Look at all these Marvel books compared to the one DC Kirby book. It's hard to argue. So that this is a good article for discussion in general. Annual tradition. It discusses some of the big ideas that Kirby had, particularly in the FF annuals. And it really, it really hits home how important those early annuals were. I mean, uh, FF Annual 1, you had Submariner Finding Atlantis. Annual number 2, The Origin of Doom. Um, you also had The Wedding of Reed Richards and Sue Storm in number 3. The announcement of her being pregnant in number 5. The birth of Franklin Richards in number 6, along with you know the first appearance of Annihilus. I mean, those annuals are very important to the overall run of Kirby's FF tenure. Hit a nice gallery of pages here. I love when they give you the two-page spread over this tabloid size. It's just awesome. Got a nice Captain Victory spread here. My Black Panther, this is an inked page. Kirby felt passionate about this one. Put his name on it and everything. And this commandy page. Man, that's awesome. If nothing else, this like center gallery stuff of these like double pages like this is worth these Jack Kirby collectors alone. One of my favorite articles, uh, regular occurring articles from the Jack Kirby collector is the Kirby as a genre, where it discusses how he influences different artists of, well, this is 2001, but of the modern times. Um, in this one, they kind of discuss Kirby making an appearance in Supreme. <laughs> and um, over here, they show Larson reimagining this page from an earlier Thor issue, and he did it for a fill in issue he did with Dan Jurgens on a Thor run in the early 2000s. I've read this issue. I, I don't have it anymore, but it'd be fun to pull that out and compare it with that. And then go from Kirby as a genre right into a Jose Ladron uh, interview. Um, if you're not familiar with Jose, he mixes a very Kirby aesthetic also with a European aesthetic. I mean, you can see like Mobius in his work. You can see um, Jeff Darrow in his work. It's like Kirby on steroids mixed with other influences. But I mean, you really see like his layouts and stuff are very, they're Kirby-esque, but he'll use a lot more panels and pack in a lot more like finer detail, I guess you'd say. Um, he is a Mexican artist and you can, I don't know if it was translated or maybe his English is just uh, not a hundred percent. You can kind of see it in this, but he, he talks about, you know, being influenced by Kirby and all his other influences. Um, nothing really jumps out on me here in particular that it hadn't been said about Kirby and any other person mentioning it. But um, if you're not familiar with Jose Ladron, definitely go find some of his stuff. He did a cable run and that's where I found him first. He did a cable run with Joe Casey, uh, probably in like 99 or so. And it's the best cable ever was, in my opinion. Um, unfortunately, that was something I used to just read at the comic shop. I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> um, I bought so many books. It was I was working at a comic shop at the time. So I was able to just like, oh, there's a shelf copy of this. It looks Kirby-ish. I'm going to read it. But then he goes on and he does like a Thor annual, uh, an FF annual, and just uh, Inhumans mini series. He's, he's pretty prolific really, but you can definitely see the Kirbiness in his work right here. But then this kind of machinery goes beyond Kirby. And that's where you start seeing the more European influence in his work. Really good stuff. Definitely check him out. Here's some painted covers he did for his Inhuman mini series. Now we're going to get to this article about, um, uh, Kirby's 2001 Treasury Edition. I was looking forward to reading this article. 
and I was very disappointed when I was done. Basically, the writer takes time to throw Kirby under the bus and point out all the differences from the film and how like Kubrick wanted to do this, but Kirby did this. Uh, Kirby looks like he just kind of rushed this or he reused this and that. And it was, it was a pretty, I've never heard the criticism of that book in this way before. While there's always things you can criticize, but man, most people point to that book as, as a Kirby masterpiece. He, uh, he writes it, he draws it. He assists in coloring it with Mary Severin. I mean, it's a pure Kirby book. And he puts all his effort into it. It's got gorgeous splash pages. And who cares if it's exactly like the movie? The movie is the movie. The book is the book. This graphic novel is its own thing. It does point out how, like, you know, this came out eight years after the movie and it was a weird tie in anyway. They don't know if Kubrick ever even looked at it because he didn't really want, you know, stuff like that about the movie. But, um, I don't know. I was disappointed in reading this article actually. I mean, he makes valid points about things that he changed, but at the same time, it's like, who cares? I mean, I'm, I'm going to that book for Kirby really not to have an exact frame for frame reinterpretation of the movie. You know, I want some Kirbyisms in it. This is an interesting, like, kind of family tree of Kirby's mythology stuff. It all centers with with God at the middle, <laughs> and then it spawns off with like Odin and Zeus, the Celestials, and spins off from there all around. It's, it's an interesting little diagram, even all the way up into Captain Victory, which apparently Kirby tried to kind of tie into the new gods, making him the son of Orion by the end of that series. This tribute panel is good. They, uh, I, I may have actually attended this panel. Um, 2000 is the first San Diego comic con that I ever attended. And I remember going into a Kirby panel with Mark Evanier. And for some reason, I feel like they were just in there like dog and Stan Lee at the time though. So maybe I was at a different thing, but I was definitely at this convention and I don't remember seeing Gene Colan and Mary Severin who are, um, who are in this panel as well. Uh, you know, awesome hearing Gene Colan just talk about how much he loved Kirby and how much he wanted to be able to do the things that Kirby could do, but he just couldn't do it in his own way. Uh, Mary Severin that he talks about how, where Mark Avanier says that Kirby used to call certain people uh, top rate guys if he if he really respected their work. And he really respected Gene Cole and called him a top rate guy. And he called Mary Severin a top rate guy. And even to the point of, he said when he was working on the Jimmy Olsen issues with Don Rickles. And he was like, all right, Jack, how are, how are you going to do this Don Rickles? Because part of what Mark Avanier did for Kirby was gather up reference material for him when he needed it and stuff, just kind of being an assistant. And he asked how he was going to do this Don Rickle stuff because Kirby wasn't great at caricatures and he really respected Mary Severin's ability to do caricatures. And in fact, he even says he was jealous of it at point. It, he said, well, I'm going to give it a go. And if I can't get it to work, I'm going to call Mary Severin up to do it for me. <laughs> so that kind of shows you the respect Kirby had for her. Another thing here is this, in this article, they don't really mention it too much, but the Satan six cover, which is a, one of the tops comics covers. Super cool. This is, this one is inked by McFarlane and I've never seen this image uninked. So it's kind of neat to, to like really look at this and you can kind of see what McFarlane brought to it in like, like the knuckles, just adding like little McFarlane noodles to the knuckles and, um, kind of altered the face a little bit there on her. Kind of fun to explore those two. And it's, it's actually even about the same size. So that was kind of cool to see in this particular article, even though it didn't really have anything to do with it. And in this, they mentioned too, about how Kirby was always worried about other people getting work. So Kirby wanted the comics industry to flourish, not just for him, but for everybody working in comics. He wanted everybody to get work. Look at this Gene Colan piece. 
with the three characters he's mostly known for. Might hold that up a little. So even in the Jack Kirby collector, sometimes you get other stuff. I mean, look at that. It's gorgeous. Love to see that in person. This is kind of a sad article about how the X-Men movie had just come out and um, all the media coverage of it was pretty much ignoring Kirby and just giving Stan Lee the credit of creating the X-Men. Not really an article, just kind of an opinion piece about why uh, the Bicentennial Treasury Edition is so important to the writer here. And then you get another couple of gallery pages which you can just sit here and stare at this stuff. Even if you didn't read any of the articles in these, you could just sit here and stare at the artwork. That's pretty much it. There's a letters column. I didn't read any of those. I can't really comment on those. Finish up with that. Back cover is part of the, the double page spread. And that's it. That's all I got for the Jack Kirby Collector. Number 31 from March of 2001. Um, definitely seek this one out if you get one Jack Kirby Collector. I really can't point you to just one, but this one is definitely a good one to get. Uh, look it up. It's out there for sale on eBay. I know it is. Grab a copy when you can. It's worth every penny. Can't recommend it enough. Until next time, read your comments.